Paul Attinello. I'm hosting tonight Psychosocial Wednesdays. We have Kevin Liu, who is speaking on strategies for revisioning and decolonizing Jungian and post-Jungian curricula. Um, Kevin is, Kevin studied at University of Toronto and University of London and University of Essex. Um, he's now a senior lecturer and the director of the MA in Jungian and Post-Jungian Studies in the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex. He's been a former member of the Executive Committee of the IAJS, and he's also been a member of the faculty at Pacifica. Uh, he's written on, oh, a number of things. Uh, he's written on Jung and his relationship to history, Toynbee and analytical psychology. So there's history and analytical psychology going in two directions. Um, the theory of cultural complexes, sibling relationships in the Chinese and Vietnamese diaspora, and also Jungian perspectives on graphic novels and film adaptations of them. Now, his article on racial hybridity was awarded the scholarship award for best paper published in the IJJS in 2019. And um, Kevin, I'd already thought to do this. Would it be at all tacky if I, I was just going to put a copy of that article in the chat, if that's okay. Okay. I'm absolutely fine with that. So everybody gets a copy of this article. Whoops, file, oh, wait a minute, drat. Silly me, I should be more competent, shouldn't I? Um, here you are, his award-winning article on racial hybridity from a couple of years ago. You all have copies now. So um, I'm welcoming Kevin Liu, who will speak to us today, then we'll have questions afterwards. Um, up to you, Kevin. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Hello, everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Just gonna go ahead and share screen because there's quite a bit to cover. I hope uh, our colleagues can see that. Can I just get a thumbs up? Yes, so I'll go to the start from beginning. Fantastic, everyone. So first I want to thank Stefano, Bernard and Paul for this wonderful opportunity. There's a lot to cover in 30 minutes, so I'm going to jump right in. And I want to actually start this lecture with a vignette. <clears throat> in March, 2020, I attended a, an event on race and culture held by the Guild of Psychotherapists, where my former colleague, Nas Cavell, along with Dr. Shona Hunter from Leeds Beckett University were speaking. And during one of the Q&A sessions, someone from the Crown bemoaned how little awareness there was on issues of race within psychotherapy trainings. This individual then said, and I'm paraphrasing here, at least the Jungians have published an open letter on Jung's writings on Africans. They seem much more ahead of the game I'm actually quite envious and I want to be a Jungian, end quote. Now this doesn't mean we rest on our laurels and indeed we need to build on this momentum and awareness. So in this regard, I am, I am empowered by Jungian and post-Jungian colleagues. And this isn't limited to the people who've written the topic. These are just the people who have come to mind. Scholars, therapists, clinicians, and those who, for Andrew's term, are good enough all-rounders who have written on this topic and have been allies and advocates of greater awareness, some of whom are deceased, but most are still very much alive and very much active. Andrew Samuels, James Hillman, Michael Vinoy Adams, Fanny Brewster, Alan Vaughn, Mary Watkins, Helen Morgan, Robin McCoy Brooks, Ruth Callan, Rita Fordham, Arnold J. Toynbee, Jane Johnson, Sulanya Sengupta, Hannah Hennenbear, and more recently, Christopher Carter. And I will actually come back uh, to, to Chris's work a little later on. Now, I may not agree with everything our colleagues say, and I trust that they won't always agree with me. And I will take that as my starting point and as a given. But I think we're all aware of the necessary direction of travel and we can work together to get there because of the respective positions we hold in the various arms of the Jungian community. So what does decolonization actually mean? Oops. Um, 
decolonizing the curriculum has become a bit of a buzz phrase. So it might be helpful in the first instance to trace a trajectory of more recent events that have led us up to this particular moment in time. In 2013, you have the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, which led Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi to coin the hashtag Black Lives Matter. In 2014, students at University College London, and here I'm showing my UK bias, so my apologies here, are inspired by the hashtag I, am, uh, I too am Harvard campaign and launched the Why Is My Curriculum White campaign, taking aim at a Eurocentric curriculum, ignoring the experiences and contributions of Black and minority ethnic people, as well as obscuring the impact of slavery and colonialism. In 2015, you have in Cape Town, South Africa, the Roads Must Fall campaign. This refers to a call to remove a statue of Cecil Rhodes from the Cape Town campus after a student, Chumani Maxwell, threw human feces at it in protest against the university's colonial legacy. This then spreads to the University of Oxford, where students demanded that a statue of Rhodes be removed from Oriel College. And more recently, in 2019, some of you who are located in the UK and abroad may remember this, the Goldsmiths' anti-racist action so what students did there, they occupied Deptford Town Hall in Southeast London. And there are four major reasons for the occupation. Number one, a lack of anti-racist action from senior management following a series of high profile racist incidents on campus. Number two, international students were subject to surveillance and reporting practices tied to attendance that could result in deportation. Number three, Black and minority ethnic cleaning and security crews faced poor pay and working conditions, as well as the threat of outsourcing. And number four, many of the workers live locally um, in a historically working class neighborhood, but encountered difficulties to access campus facilities, including the town hall itself. Decolonization may be defined as the active resistance against colonial powers and a shifting of power towards political, economic, educational, cultural, psychic independence and power that originate from a colonized nation's own indigenous culture. This process occurs politically and also applies to personal and societal psychic, cultural, political, agricultural, and educational deconstruction of colonial um, oppression, end quote. So in terms of decolonizing academic programs specifically and decolonizing the university, I found Shaneen Pete's summary a strong starting point. So I quote again, <clears throat> they, i.e. decolonizing initiatives within universities, would require an honest examination of the violence of colonization and how this is maintained today through systems of oppression and institutions. They would include what Lenoui calls the dreaming, the facilitation of learning opportunities which encourage a cultural resurgence and a reimagining of governing judicial, educational, and community structures designed to empower Indigenous peoples. I would add to this that alongside the reformation of Indigenous institutions, there must be a reformation of programs directed towards non-Indigenous peoples so that they can leave behind their cognitive and experience, um, experiential deficits." End quote. So when we speak of decolonizing the curriculum, we're speaking about a university's or institution's awareness of the connection between a university's history and how it responds to calls and demands to redress a balance of power. Knowledge production is intimately connected to power and what we teach can either challenge unfair power structures or they can sustain them. As is clear from the Roads Must Fall campaign, universities are infrastructures of empire and have benefited from colonialism. Decolonizing the curriculum is one way to potentially disrupt the Western project of civilization and to challenge a largely Eurocentric canon of truth. The point of decolonization is not only to deconstruct knowledge and the reproduction of one-sided accounts of what this constitutes, but to transform them into something more equitable and more reflective of the actual reality that Black and minority ethnic communities have contributed significantly to all subjects being taught within higher education. However, while the desire to disrupt these circulating discourses of domination is warranted, do they really constitute an exercise in decolonization? And here, I'm led to a really influential, uh, influential article by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang. 
And they argue rather persuasively that decolonization is not a metaphor. And I've drawn three quotations here that actually capture the gist of their argument, a very powerful argument. Um, and one that actually doesn't sit quite well. Um, and you know, I, I think this is really important in many ways. So the first quotation I have here, the easy adoption of decolonizing discourse by educational advocacy and scholarship, evidenced by the increasing number of calls to decolonize our schools or uh, use decolonizing methods or decolonize, or oh, actually, my fault, everyone. I've, um, I'm reading the wrong one. I had several that I was choosing from. So I will um, jump to this one here. Decolonization as a metaphor allows people to equivocate these contradictory decolonial desires because it turns decolonization into an empty signifier to be filled by any track towards liberation. In reality, the, track, the tracks walk all over land and people in settler context. Decolonization in the settler colonial context must involve the repatriation of land simultaneous to the recognition of how land and relations to land have always already been differently understood and enacted. That is all of the land and not just symbolically, this is precisely why decolonization is necessarily unsettling. And the second quotation, the easy adoption of decolonization as the metaphor and nothing else is a form of this anxiety because it is a premature attempt at reconciliation. The absorption of decolonization by settler social justice frameworks is one way the settler disturbed by her own settler status tries to escape or contain the unbearable searchlight of complicity." End quote. And the third and final direct quotation, decolonization is not converting indigenous politics to a Western doctrine of liberation. It is not a philanthropic process of helping the at risk and alleviating suffering. It is not a generic term for a struggle against oppressive conditions and outcomes. The broad umbrella of social justice may have room underneath for all these efforts. By contrast, decolonization specifically requires the repatriation of indigenous land and life. Decolonization is not a metonym for social justice." Unquote. Now, I'm still not completely sure where I stand with this, but it's a perspective that needs to be acknowledged and taken account of, i.e. we need to face and acknowledge and reflect upon our own complicity in maintaining power structures by using this tool, if you will, of decolonizing the curriculum. So my thinking on the topic is constantly shifting with the more I read and the different perspectives coming to my attention. How far are we willing to go and how much are we actually willing to give up? In many ways, the important questions being asked in this article are indicative of a symbolic mirror being held up to those who champion anti-racist approaches and initiatives to decolonize institutions. So what I want to be careful about using, uh, so I want to be careful about using the term decolonized without fully embracing and thinking critically about what is, you know, what it actually might entails. That being said, an initiative based on the principles of social justice and greater equality in education can't be all that bad. In fact, it's absolutely aligned with what higher education is purportedly about, challenging accepted regimes of knowledge, engaging in critical debate, and creating a space for change that can go beyond the ivory towers of universities and having a meaningful, meaningful impact on how we live and conduct ourselves in the wider world. I would suggest framing a social justice project along these lines as revisioning Jungian curricula and pedagogy to better reflect and align with those aspects of Jung's thinking that support openness, balance, and the psyche's potential to creatively imagine a multiplicity of futures. It is one that would support progress and champion greater equality, but especially racial equality for all, but particularly for those who wish to engage in this field of endeavor we call analytical psychology. Now, I want to focus on three initiatives or three points from which this revisioning may begin, and here I've listed them. Number one, conducting an equity audit of our various programs. Number two, the dissemination of knowledge through events and other means. And number three, a changing of policies and procedures. And here I um, have two main subheadings, one under leadership and one under policies. All right. Now, much of what I have to say is shaped by my work as the co-chair of a tackling racism group at my university and also being empowered 
by Christopher Carter's JP article, and in particular his appendix, where he calls the IAP to take corrective actions, publicly denunciating but not erasing the white supremacist writings of Carl Gustav Jung. Some of what I'm proposing might sound obvious, and if that's the case, then please bear with me, because although analytical psychology has made some significant strides that other depth psychological schools have not in terms of race equality and acknowledging a racist past, there's still a long way to go. We are, I believe, at the start of the journey. I'm also very keen to know what our colleagues, but especially our colleagues who are clinicians and therapists, what they think of some of these proposals. So will these work in a therapeutic organization? Will some elements work and not others? And can some of these suggestions be revised so that they can be implemented in specific ways that reflect the ethos of each and every organization? So let's start with the equity audit of Jungian and post-Jungian curricula. So let's count, right? It sounds simple, but let's count. And um, this is a simple yet effective method I actually picked up from uh, a student I taught at Pacifica named Soha Al Jurf, and she's actually doing some great work. She's got a new podcast coming out as well. This was one of the episodes, so please go check it out. She's doing really, really great work. So the first step then is to look for the propor proportion, sorry, of male authors to female authors, but also the balance between white authors and black and minority ethnic authors. Now, for the purposes of this very brief presentation, I'm going to focus on the proportion of Black and minority ethnic authors on reading lists. Now, there's obviously some clear limitations to this. One right off the bat is intersectionality. We can't section off race as a realm of its own. We have to consider race in conjunction with gender, with economics, et cetera, et cetera. But again, this is very brief, but hopefully it, uh, it shows well, what I'm actually trying to get at. And again, this is a starting point. So intersectionality and not in, um, uh, reflecting that intersectional approach is one limitation of what I'm doing here. There are some other limitations. So for example, if I see a reading by Michael Vinoy Adams, I could count it as being penned by a white author, but equally Michael Vinoy Adams has written on the topic of multiculturalism, He's someone I absolutely respect, I admire his work, and I perceive him as an ally in this endeavor of revisioning, and his commitment to multiculturalism might permeate all facets of his work. So where do we put him? Where do we count him? So Michael Vinoy Adams becomes a problem, not a problem as in he's a problem, but it's a problem of classification. So it's something we need to be careful of. Now, there's also a distinction to be made um, about black and minority ethnic authors located in the global North, i.e. those located and perhaps raised in affluent countries located in the Northern Hemisphere and those in the Global South. The EDI initiatives, so the Equality, Diversity and Inclusivity initiatives of the Global North may differ from the Global South. And those from the Global North might be seen as appropriating a discourse that is in vogue, i.e. they are coming from a privileged position, largely a privileged economic position that turns decolonization into a metaphor as Tuck and Yang have argued. Now, some other limitations. There's also the added difficulty of authors who, for example, reside and represent the global South, who, who might be adopting Eurocentric Jungian ideas without necessarily being critical, but critical about how their own contexts can shape and enhance and build upon the, mobil the mobilization of these ideas themselves. In this way, Eurocentric ideas may be perpetuated by those located in the Global South. The next limitation I want to point out, in many of these courses on Jungian and post-Jungian studies, there are certain modules that are dedicated to engaging primary sources specifically, i.e. the writings of Jung as found in the CW and beyond. That being the case, one might expect the proportion of white to black and minority ethnic authors to be uh, leaning heavily to one side, although more would need to be said about whether black and minority ethnic writers are proportionally represented when pointing to key commentaries or relevant secondary sources. The next limitation, now in the UK, and this might be the case across the board, across institutions, so please correct me if I'm wrong, there is a division between essential reading in a syllabus and recommended reading in a syllabus. 
So essential reading is deemed to be mandatory and thus could be read as being more important and holding a higher status than recommended readings. So a more detailed study would need to investigate not only the proportion of black and minority ethnic authors on any given reading list, but the number of readings achieving the status of essential reading. So there are a lot of gray areas and a more nuanced and detailed study is certainly warranted, but conducting an initial count can provide an interesting snapshot of what the starting assumptions of a module are, or indeed an entire program may be, whether certain perspectives are privileged over others. So as my example, I will take a highly popular postgraduate taught degree focusing on analytical psychology. Now, Said degree is made up of four modules or courses. So I've called it course one, course two, course three, and course four. So in course one, there were 110 readings that were assigned, and this includes um, essential reading and recommended reading. Eight are identifiable as, as being penned by black or minority ethnic authors. Zero are listed on the essential reading list. So overall, if we're just counting the proportion of black and minority ethnic authors, you have 7% of the reading list. Going on to course number two, 198 readings are assigned, again, including essential or recommended. Five readings are identifiable as being penned by a black or minority ethnic author. And actually all five are penned by the same person. So this amounts to 0.25% of the reading list and two of these five readings actually achieved essential reading status. Going on to course three, 45 readings are assigned, zero are identifiable as being penned or written by black or minority ethnic authors. Going on to course four, there are 161 readings, 24 are identifiable as black and minority ethnic authors. Of those 24, only four achieved the status, status of essential reading. So again, your overall average just for the proportion of black and minority ethnic authors is 15%. So overall on this particular program, there are 514 readings, all right? So 514 readings are assigned of which 37 were written by authors identifiable as black and minority ethnic. This gives us a percentage of 7% of the curriculum. However, if we look closer, and we categorize the readings according to essential readings, only six of the 37 readings penned by black and minority ethnic authors achieved essential reading status. Those classified as recommended readings, I'll remind everyone, are less likely to be read and engaged with. So if that's the case, then the percentage becomes even worse. So six divided by 514 gives you 1%. 1% of this trailblazing course, all right? is made up in terms of the essential reading con contributions from those who are black or minority ethnic. So my dear colleagues, not only do we have a problem, but the current state of play is absolutely heartbreaking. Now I encourage all colleagues to start off with the respective syllabi or courses they have a hand in designing and to our editors of journals to conduct a similar review. So as a starting point, I would urge all colleagues who have the power to change things, and this includes me, I'm definitely just at the start of my own journey as well, to consider engaging with research conducted by colleagues in the Global South and really exploring whether these can be positioned as essential readings on our lists, how they complement themes we're already covering, how they provide a different perspective and how they enrich the learning experience of all our students. And maybe what's really needed is a survey and annotated bibliography of all indigenous and black and minority ethnic scholars who have published works from an analytical psychological lens. And this is a larger project to be kept in mind, perhaps even a collaborative project. So if anyone's interested, please get in touch with me. Now, this can't change, or sorry, this change can't happen overnight. It will take time, but I think now is the time to start. Now, this leads me to um, the next point, the dissemination of knowledge through events and other means. I'm actually gonna just stop share because I want to see all our colleagues right now. So can I ask colleagues here via a show of hands, whether Black History Month, so October in the UK, February in the US, or Black Pride over three days in July in the UK in 2021, 
is celebrated in the respective Jungian organizations. So do we go out of our way to celebrate Black History Month or Black Pride? So we do have some. Okay, fantastic. I'd be really interested to hear what people do and maybe we can start building um, a repository of best practice. So that's really important. So I'll go back to share screen and we'll go from here. Okay, um, right. So black history and the contribution of all minority ethnic communities to analytical psychology should be celebrated, not just in the month to which it has been designated, but across the entire year. And let's really begin to open our eyes as to how colleagues who identify as black or minority ethnic, but particularly those located in the global south, can help us to destabilize our Eurocentric understanding of analytical psychology. And I wonder further, if I can get to my next slide, whether we can take more proactive steps to formalize the need to learn from diverse colleagues and to be led by them. So for example, looking at our conferences as one way knowledge is being produced and disseminated. Are we in a position to commit to setting targets for the number of black and minority ethnic presenters at our conferences? Are we in a position to commit to setting targets for keynote speakers from the global south for each and every conference that our respective organizations run? This includes working into budgets the cost of simultaneous interpretation. The same might be applied to our journals and any special projects with which they may engage. This means a commitment to translation costs and to disseminating works written in languages other than English. Committing to these initiatives necessitates representation on key decision-making committees. And this leads me to my third section. So changing policies and procedures and again, I'm splitting this into two sections, leadership and policies. So across most UK higher education institutions, there are very few individuals identifying as black and minority ethnic in the most senior leadership positions. According to research completed by Kawan Bopau, BME academic staff are less likely to be in senior managerial roles. As of 2015-16, there were 20 UK black and minority ethnic deputy or pro vice chancellors compared to 530 who identify as white. Among UK academic staff, only 3.9% of BME staff were in senior managerial positions. In terms of obtaining professorships, and for colleagues in the US, this means tenure, full tenure. At the time of Bhopal's book, um, when it was published, 13,270 professors identified as white compared to a total of 1,050 who identify as black and minority ethnic, and of which only 70 are black. So our various organizations may already be committed in writing and in principle to forwarding an EDI agenda, but are they being proactive? Are they being the visionaries and trailblazing innovation rather than merely reacting to the realities of a changing external environment? One way to be proactive is to implement sponsorship programs. And this is different from mentoring for those black and minority ethnic colleagues who desire to progress their careers by taking on leadership roles within their respective organizations. Mentoring generally entails one person providing advice to another on key developmental areas. A sponsor is much more involved. A sponsor is an advocate for the sponsored individual or party. Through the sponsor's seniority, the networks he, she, they have built up over time, the sponsor will be a person's advocate in public and behind closed doors. Now, obviously the sponsored person needs to be up to the task, but it's about opening doors that may be inaccessible to some regardless of what the regulations state. It's about putting people forward so that they get the chance to prove themselves. And this leads me to my next suggestion or point. All right, the Rooney rule. So this rule is named after Dan Rooney, the former owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers and former chairman of the league's diversity committee. So this is an NFL policy. This is the National Football League um, that requires league teams to interview ethnic minority candidates for head coaching and senior football operation, uh, operations jobs. The rule has given birth to other similar rules, such as the Russell rule in collegiate basketball and the Mansfield rule in the practice of law. So when leadership positions become available in our various Jungian organizations, 
are we in a position to implement a version of the rule, mainly that at least one diverse candidate is interviewed for the job? Committing to this means that we approach this as an honest and open act of due diligence. It is not simply a tick box exercise, and some have actually accused the rule for encouraging such practices. Arguably, it benefits everyone to have a more diverse representation in leadership positions. More diversity means a stronger representation of perspectives and angles that may be missed if leadership remains predominantly held by white individuals. Right, so I'll move on to my final section on policies. So I did a bit of homework. I reviewed the complaints procedures of two Jungian clinical organizations and the code of ethics of four Jungian organizations. And I looked up eight in total. So I won't name these organizations, but I would applaud all those organizations who have provided on their websites, their code of ethics. And in particular, I applaud those who have also granted access to their complaints procedures. Usually what I found was that there's a private section that you have to sign in. And I'm assuming that those regulations will be protected in that area. Now, putting this in the public sphere, the code of ethics, um, the complaints procedure, this displays to me at least a commitment to transparency and openness to learning that is so central to changing organizational cultures for the better. In conducting this initial assessment, I only came across two organizations that provided diversity statements and or statements about Black Lives Matter. Now, I have some general comments and observations to make, but please note, I'm not working with a huge sample size. These are some initial thoughts based on what I could find, but I still think this is an important starting point, a point uh, at which we can begin the conversation. So the first question that came to mind when I reviewed these two policies, these, um, these uh, um, uh, not the code of ethics, but the, um, the complaints procedures of these two organizations, the first thing that came to mind is what is the makeup of the ethics committee who's actually chairing these panels? So is there a commitment to diverse representation on these committees? And based on my understanding, some organizations elect members onto the ethics committee and they serve for a stipulated period of time, let's say three years, with the limit as to how many times membership may be renewed, let's say two additional times. There also seems to be scope to co-opt members into the committee, presumably depending on the complexities on any case they are considering. Now, another general observation as an outsider, i.e. someone who's not a clinician, what support is being offered both to those making the complaint and those against whom a complaint is being made? So are these two parties supposed to bear the anxiety and distress of a complaint alone? Do we assume that because they're analysts or very close to becoming analysts, they should be able to work this out themselves or perhaps alongside their supervising analysts and that the burden is on individuals rather than the organization to provide that very support. So what is the organization's responsibility to its members and in particular, their mental health in an organization dedicated to mental health, no less, during what is admittedly a very stressful period. So that's just the, you know, one of the big things I noticed, What's, what support mechanisms are there to support the people who are complaining and those about whom uh, the complaint is being made. Now, in particular, I'm thinking of complaints or ethical cases involving accusations of racism. If this occurs and under the current protocols that I've been able to examine, there is scope to ensure that at least one member of the ethics committee, whether they are elected for a term or brought in specifically for that case, to be a member identifying as black and minority ethnic. I think this is, a very, uh, this is the very least that could be done to ensure fairness and to build trust and faith in the regulations themselves, i.e. that cases involving accusations of racism will be dealt with seriously and not brushed aside as, quote, a clash of personalities, a clash of relationship styles, transference, counter-transference, the constellation of racial animus, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, can there be a commitment that every case involving an accusation of racism be investigated so we bypass the informal resolution stage and that an external black and minority ethnic colleague who meets the criteria be co-opted as part of the investigation? Building trust in an organization's complaints procedure and its transparency 
is central to the project of revisioning Jungian and post-Jungian curricula in organizations. By adopting this approach, we're sending a clear signal regarding the seriousness with which issues of race and racism are being treated within the organization. If people don't have trust in the process, then you may see people deciding not to report certain incidents because, hey, it won't be taken seriously, it's an old boys network at play, and the person in question will just get off anyway, they're protected. Revisioning, as I'm using it in this particular context, is about challenging these very power structures. Having at least one member particularly knowledgeable about these issues, where one does not need to explain what a microaggression is, what constitutes an act of racism, what structural racism is, what institutional racism is, can build more robust confidence in the process itself. Now, I suggest the same be done for complaints involving all protected characteristics as outlined in the Equality Act 2010. And obviously this is more of the, the UK legislation I'm speaking to. Equally, we should be paying close attention when cases are brought against those who possess one of the protected characteristics. Now, perhaps some of the protected characteristics and complaints surrounding them are more prevalent and applicable to the types of cases being brought to the ethics committees of therapeutic organizations. But the reason I raise this is because of recent academic findings, and in particular, a recent critical assessment of implicit biases in student evaluations of courses and teaching by Troy Heffernan. Very briefly, student evaluations can be influenced by racist, sexist, and homophobic prejudices. The data informing student surveys is flawed and can be prejudiced against those being assessed. Assessments are influenced by student demographics, the teaching academics culture and identity, and other criteria not associated with the course quality or the efficacy of the lecturer's delivery. More and more, these assessments feed into promotion processes and what on the surface is a bad score without looking into the complex motivations that may have contributed to that score can have a deleterious impact on progression and promotion. So what you end up with is a tension between the sector's stated commitment to hiring more representatives from underrepresented groups, but members of these very groups are most likely to progress at a much slower pace and are perceived to be underperforming because of a monitoring mechanism that is deeply flawed and driven by bias. So if we translate this into the realm of Jungian academic and clinical organizations, perhaps there's some work that needs to be done around the data surrounding the frequency with which members from underrepresented backgrounds or those possessing one of the protected characteristics are subject to complaints procedures or are called to account by ethics committees. So the next logical question is, who's keeping the data? Does this data exist? And can we look at this to pinpoint any larger trends that may be occurring, which in turn will help us devise the types of policies that can make a real impact and to ensure that a commitment to equality, diversity and inclusivity and tackling racism are at the heart of all we do as a community. Right, and that's the end. Thank you, Kevin. That's lovely. Um, and I must say, on a complete tangent, aesthetically beautiful PowerPoint. Um, if I can open up, this is a slightly different angle. Uh, two linked uh, aspects here. The history of talking about race and racism has a lot of emotion in it. And there are writers who are characterized by anger. There are writers who are characterized by sort of caring, there are people who are trying to be more logical. At the same time, I'm wondering about if you have a point of view on, you know, complicity and maintaining an existing structure or hegemony mm -hmm. um, does tend to be tied to comfort, right? Mm -hmm. And when the universe is more messed up as in the 1930s or 2008, mm -hmm. et cetera, or the present, Mm -hmm. There seems to be a tendency both for certain structures to dissolve more easily, but at the same time, individuals in certain groups grab mm -hmm. more and mm -hmm. want to hold on to what they've got. We do seem to be in the middle of a big, mm -hmm. messy bunch of transmission transitions. Mm -hmm. How does that, do you think that has an impact on what you're talking about? 
Yeah. Um, so what I'm I'm getting from what you're you're asking, Paul, is that there's this kind of almost implicit tribalism um, where people who are on the left and and are kind of um, forwarding anti-racist policies, they'll find the evidence to kind of support what they want and the stats to support what they want, and those potentially we could position them on the right, we'll find the stats that they want to say, well, it's not just you, it, it's more economics, right, than, than, than race. And that there is a legitimate claim um, to the, you know, the white working class. Um, and, and there are some real concerns there. And I think in the UK specifically, a lot of this galvanized around Brexit. So if you remember, yeah, you know, so, some of the, the advert, uh, I don't know, call them adverts um, where you had Nigel Farage standing in front of a bus where you know there's a queue of supposedly refugees and yeah there, there's some very kind of politically charged messages that are going out there now in in terms of our community I think it's actually really important to to be very careful not to go into either or position mm -hmm. but to be aware of your position so I'm aware that even though I may do my utmost to try to remain um, in a position where I can see that, yes, there are real concerns on the right, right? That, you know, white working class people are legitimately afraid of something. And then equally on the left, people are legitimately, uh, you know, they have a gripe. I know where my position is, I'm, I'm on the left, but then it becomes very difficult to kind of maintain that more grounded approach where we're really trying to create dialogue and listen to these different points of view. Um, I would say that ultimately I can see the logic of some of the arguments, especially as they've been, anyone who's following um, the, the various Jungian discussion lists, I can see the logic when people are arguing around political theory, um, larger trends, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that certainly kind of has its place. And I find some of it from a more very academic point of view, actually very persuasive, but equally what it boils down to for me, I'm actually interested in what's happening on the ground. So when another mother or father or sibling hears that a brother or sister has been killed again, who's black, well, I want to know that story. I want to know the essence of that story, how it feels on the ground. I want to know what people say, what they think and what they feel if they're black and minority ethnic walking down the street and they've been spat at again. That's more of the, the realm that I want to work in, Paul. And I think analytical psychology can really support that, support that at the level of, if you will, qualitative analysis, qualitative interviewing. The larger picture, yes, absolutely. You know, you, you can find that data to persuade you of the other way. But if I focus on that lived experience, I think that's where analytical psychology helps, can really help, um, and also one that's per perhaps more in tune with my own position. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stefano would like to ask a question verbally, which means we're being hegemonic and treating the three members of Psychosocial Wednesdays as in charge, but hey, we're powerful. So Stefano, you have a question. Oh, and you're glitching a bit, I'm afraid. It's, it's a comment and then a question. <clears throat> we are, I think, 34, we are 39, 90, 92% of the audience is white. And it's a huge amount of non-white people, almost 10%. But this le le leads me to the comment. Um, in our field, in analytical psychology, non-white people are a niche. This is for different reasons. Some are, are known. You might remember what Andrew, Andrew Samuel said at the end, of, the end of the San Francisco Analysis and Activism Conference, especially looking at this matter, the fact that analytical psychology right now is still a white matter. He said, um, training institute should stop asking for a master degree to candidates. I would like to go even further and say training institutes should stop asking for a master degree, should stop asking for a bachelor degree, and should evaluate uh, candidates or 
those that want to apply beyond nationality, beyond sex, beyond gender, beyond financials, because if you have money, you can train right now. If you don't have money, it's very difficult to train and pay for your own uh, fees, supervision, analysis. So my proposal is that we need also to decolonize the training institutions, mm -hmm. the white training institutions, mm -hmm. and support those that would like to train, that have the ability to train, to become an amazing analyst, not based on the degrees that they collected in their early life, but on the willingness to become a union mm -hmm. analyst, which means undergo training analysis, um, supervision, and learning the art and craft on, of analysis. Um, what do you think, Kev? Mm. And, and thank you for this speech because, or presentation, because perhaps this is the, the, the most activist presentation we had this year. And it's a pity there is almost no one from the 400 people of analysis and activism, mm. no one from the steering committee. We will make sure we share these two analysis and activism because this is truly an analysis and activism speech. But what about decolonizing the training institutes. Thank you so much, Stefano, for your comment. You know, really appreciate the support as well. Yeah, you know, what, what, a, what a bold um, suggestion that can only come from the mind of Stefano Carpani. Um, there is definitely something in it, Stefano. I would probably frame it more as whether or not, again, it's not so much about if it's a kind of BA or an MA, but if there is sufficient evidence that there is experience that is applicable to their training, if that can be counted. So there's certainly something to be said about having a, some flexibility in the criteria itself, right? So yes, you're right. It may not be BA or MA, but is there sufficient external um, experience that might allow them or give one um, confidence that someone and this, gets, yeah. uh, and this mm -hmm. can be seen in the in the interviews that we go through mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. Zurich we have to write a 10 pages autobiography let's say mm -hmm. where you talk about yourself mm -hmm. that is analytical psychology oriented mm -hmm. you have to go through six interviews so one interview mm -hmm. with the same people which is usually an experienced analyst and a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really the willingness to train because mm -hmm. you know, so many people mm -hmm. I met when I started the training, they were starting to train because they had the money, they were retired and they wanted to take this not seriously, but to take it as a hobby profession. Mm -hmm. Fuck them mm -hmm. to be very clear. This is something very serious to train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually white people, of a certain background have money to trade. What about mm -hmm. everyone else? Also, mm -hmm. institute should have scholarship. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that, yeah. That go to minorities. Mm -hmm. And minorities could be even a white man, a white woman who has no economical means to train, but would mm -hmm. become an amazing analyst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are, are, there, are there any scholarships right now? Of no. the various organizations no. that colleagues it's not, belong it's to? Not part of the, it's not part of the general idea. It's, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. rare. It's rare. Mm -hmm. Some of which has to do with the general economic structure of the groups. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I am experimenting slightly. Louise Austin asked to speak live. We don't usually do this, but as Stefano has done this, let's see how this works. Uh, Louise? Midsummer Rebellion. Very good. <laughs> speak up. Uh, oh, well, well, I am the supervisee of Kevin. So I think I'm allowed to break a rule. <laughs> um, so thank you for that, Kevin, because that was really thought provoking. As you know, um, I run a program in an art psychotherapy training, so that feels very relevant. So I had two comments to make, just reflections more than anything else, and then a question. Yeah. So I think the first comment is, I think definitely there's something about who do we bring in right at the beginning of training? And I think scholarships are so important. So for this year at the Institute for Arts where I work, it's the first time we've done a scholarship. 
Mm. And it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. It gives a very clear and very different statement. Um, because whoever starts at the beginning means they will become the scholars of the future. So mm. if you don't have ethnic minorities starting mm. training, then you're not mm. going to get your scholars. Um, so that was the first comment. I also think what you said about mentoring and sponsorship mm -hmm. is really vital. And it's something that we just don't, I think we take mm -hmm. for granted a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if I'm a minority, my voice is silenced. So I need somebody behind me to help mm -hmm. me get my voice out. Mm -hmm. So I actually mm -hmm. think what you said about sponsorship was really thought provoking. Mm -hmm. And then the question I had mm -hmm was given we're coming from a Jungian perspective and this idea that metaphors can be templates that we live by, mm -hmm. what is the metaphor that needs to change to get the change we want? Hmm. Okay. A response doesn't strike me right now, Louise, about what metaphor needs to change. I will say what is on my mind because you spoke and, you know, you're here. So thank you very much. But a part of um, a part of this talk had to be edited out heavily because Paul kindly told me I had 30 minutes, not an hour. So th there was a rush to, to take things out. Me there was a section. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought wrong. Yeah, um, there was a whole section on methods. And this is, again, somewhere where I think analytical psychology is well-placed to contribute to um, this project in revisioning, or for some, it might still be called decolonization. Susan Rowland, Susan, you're here. Thank you so much. There was a section on you um, about your work on arts-based research. And obviously with Louise, with Bryony, um, Susan, some of the great students you have at Pacifica, absolutely phenomenal as well. The arts-based method is a way we can begin to deconstruct. Because if you think about the assessments on certain programs, um, and, and this is you know, what was coming to my mind, we do privilege a 5,000 word essay or more, right? And now, you know, if you think about it, well, people would need to, as Stefano pointed out, people would need to be in a privileged position in the first instance to have the capacity to build the skills, to write those types of papers and those essays. And one way to even things out, not make it easier, by no means not make it easier, but one way to even things out is to diversify your assessment. And it really means sitting with an arts-based approach and some of the discomfort that may come out. And I'm gonna hold my hands up. You know, Louise, Bryony, you have made me absolutely uncomfortable, but a good uncomfortable and a comfortable that switches a way of thinking and approaching academia and what constitutes academic work, All right? So that's what comes to my forefront. It's not so much a metaphor that needs to be changed, but our way of assessing learning I think needs to change. And we are, as a Jungian community, in a prime position to do just that. Yeah, thank you. Well, and um, thank you to Susan, Louise, and, and Bryony. Let me, um, well, um, a comment by Ulrika Rizemeyer regarding marginalization and unawareness towards minorities. Can we learn from the positive developments in feminism? Mm -hmm. Understanding, of course, feminism is huge, but any comment? Sure. On that sure, absolutely. I think there's so much to be learned. So, you know, with um, the Equality Acts and, and the various groups that they protect, you know, people are fighting for their rights to be recognized as, as individuals. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn in, um, you know, in that kind of solidarity. So actually, one film I'm actually rewatching, talking about intersectionality, if I can grab it. Ugh. Sorry, everyone. I'm old fashioned with DVDs. So Pride, has anyone heard of this film? Is this the British, the British film from just a few years ago, five or yes. six years ago? Yes, sorry. Yeah, no. absolutely. Where, um, you know, a, a group goes to help these, these minors um, and they realize that, yes, they're, they're coming from very different positions, but they're coming together on a specific cause. And, and, and to me, this is a great representation of the intersectionality we're talking, you know, I was talking about. So in response to that, absolutely, there's a lot that we can learn from feminism and other fights, if you will, across the spectrum. But equally, I do want to be 
very careful as well to protect the individual histories of each and every one of those fights. So the fights, you know, for, for female rights, it has its own history, it has its own trajectory, and we still need to respect it on the grounds and to know what's happened there. And the same with race, disability, et cetera. So I think, yes, there are points of convergence and points of working together, but equally, we also have to kind of respect that difference as well. Um, a comment from Desiree Gonzalez that I, that I thought was interesting. There will be more willingness if the curriculum was more inclusive of black and minority histories and the history yeah. of psychology coming from those ancient cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I think one, um, one challenge many universities have run into is whether or not they can build, let's say at least one module as compulsory for the entire university, regardless if you're taking a STEM subject, regardless if you're taking history, sociology, et cetera, et cetera, economics. And this would be that module where we have that diversity, those global perspectives that are built into it. But it's, it's tough, Paul, and, and our colleague who's made that comment as well, because what you usually run into is the brick wall of administration. Oh, well, you know, we can't quite do this because that would mean rejigging the entire schedule, taking 30 credits away from this course, et cetera, et cetera. So there's always going to be a reason. And what I found in this work in particular is that there's a lot of goodwill and energy going in. But when you hit that hump, when you run up, you know, I see Liz nodding her head. When you run up against it, you really actually do lose so much energy. Um, and you, you can potentially become so dejected. So there, you know, whatever we do as a community, we have to probably work into that, that aspect where there are going to be brick walls that we run against. How do we kind of support each other to keep going, even though we're facing those brick walls? Um, by the way, the obviously experientially seeing someone speak makes a big difference. And I know that something that happened in, you know, my background is historical musicology historical musicology is, used to be terrifically white. And a international conference in Chicago where Sam Floyd, the leader of the Jazz Institute of Chicago and was speaking, he, he is black. And there were six black postgraduates in musicology in the front row, which to be honest, I'd never seen that before. And there was something about that moment of doing right, that had more impact than, than words. Mm -hmm. Amr Dean would like to speak. Let me, pardon me, I have to look for a button. Got it. You can unmute yourself, Amr. Hi, hi, good evening. Hi, Kevin, thanks, uh, thanks for that talk. Absolutely powerful and excellent work as always. Just wanted to share some comments just as a student that's on your course, I've been on your course and just to say, I joined the course because of my experience being around leftist circles, anti-racism and um, LGBT groups and found certain patterns and certain experiences that I felt that Jungian psychology could shed some light on. And I saw always since uh, Jungian psychology is something a bit more conservative rather than something that's left. Um, I read on the nature of the psyche recently last week and you had actually crossed my mind and reading that again after going through the course, it really did send a shock reading some of the stuff on primitive psychology. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, also, as you know, I work as a professional artist and I really struggle with writing and, you know, because of my, uh, partly because of my um, ethnic background and also my class background as well, trying to match the quality of writing that's expected on the course has been quite difficult. And so I, I really want to thank um, Brian for the, for, you know, smashing the wall for the arts-based um, research. So I think that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. my, my only question is, is that, um, you know, how do we, you know, who are the latest voices on addressing and Jung's psychology? A lot of these, um, the pillars of Jung psychology, especially on the nature of the psyche, a lot, of, a lot about primitive psychology is very important to Jungian psychology and it still exists within post-Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. I just feel that, um, you know, shaking these pillars and removing them completely or completely, you know, putting them to side as, you know, something that's colonial is something that needs to kind of be looked at a bit more yeah. in a careful manner. As you might agree, if someone left is that there is a connection between um, colonization, Western imperialism and capitalism and therefore secularism. But there is parts of the world which do experience, you know, different aspects of culture, psychological culture, collective culture and consciousness. And so I do think that Jung does point on some of these things, perhaps not put it in the best frame of language but I do think that these things need to be considered as well and also the the diverse range of 
political and you know um this huge spectrum of diversity that the course attracts as well i would just be worried about isolating you know you know people certain people or certain groups or certain experiences as well i think there's sometimes there's an archetypal um lens to our archetypal feel to leftist politics you know there's it's, everything's very highly charged at the moment as well yeah. so yeah 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 you understand thanks yeah no absolutely absolutely i mean you know even though my politics are leading to the left the the left has a lot to to answer for right now um and again just looking at the the growth in my own thinking um you know if you look at d'angelo and, and white fragility and there are lots of people who've talked uh, and have really done some good work in, in whiteness studies. So um, uh, my colleague from uh, Leeds Beckett, Shona Hunter, she has the Rutledge uh, Handbook of Whiteness Studies coming out soon. And I think that'll be definitely a much more kind of critical approach. But, you know, going to, to, to some of the suggestions being made by D'Angelo, I mean, you can see why people have their backs up, right? Where you're constantly, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, you know, if... If, if you start crying, you're a racist, you know, if, yeah, so, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm being facetious, but I, you know, I, I hope I, people are, uh, my, my point is actually being conveyed here. So I think there's a, a lot that the, the left needs to, to answer for. Equally, like I said, I want to kind of focus more on the lived experience. And I think whatever we do in the Jungian community needs to at least strike that balance of the multiplicity of voices. So again, if you're part of um, the the IJJS um, list, there are multiple voices going on, on, on some very hot topics. I'm not going to mention names, but some of the projects I have in mind would be to have those people in conversation with, with each other in some way, shape or form. Um, in terms of the, the current state of play, well, I actually go back to Michael Vinoy Adams. I actually really, really enjoyed his book. And I think it was published in 96 if, if I remember correctly, I may be wrong. Maybe 98 comes to mind as well. Um, Chris Carter's article, really enjoyed that. So there are certainly people at that edge, you know, wanting to, to, to kind of change the structures Emmer, that, that are so difficult. And as I said, it, it's not just about writing specifically on the topic, but changing the ways we think about assessment within it. So Susan, her work on art space research, I think is going to be a big part of it and we need to frame it as a centerpiece in this larger project so i hope that answers your question Emmer. thank you um i think there are other comments but they're mostly i think in line um i know that can i can i add something paul yes because what what you your presentation was really spot on and you never mentioned the complexes. So add on what you said, theory of complexes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wrote a paper titled The Fascist Analyst and the New Myth of Analysis mm -hmm. when the encounter between the analyst and the analyzant is problematic, especially because of the analyst uh, behavior. And the analyst doesn't have to be being a fascist a white man could be a human being of whatever nationality, color, gender, age. And the fascist, I would say, loses because perhaps dissociating, because, because taken by a complex, he loses integrity and eros. And when he or she, when they lose integrity and eros, it's not possible to make an analysis. So on top of everything you said, we should also take into account these other aspect. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Stefano. And that just actually reminded me, you know, of something else I, I really wanted to, to say in response to Emma as well, is that I'm absolutely serious. And I count myself in this category, um, I'm completely in deficit. We have huge Jungian communities in Brazil, in China, and, and are they on our reading lists? Are we learning from them? And when I'm, you know, when I'm referring to these colleagues, I'm not referring to them picking up a, a Jungian or post-Jungian idea and applying it to their particular context. I actually want to see what your ways of knowing, right, in your specific context, how can that enrich and change analytical psychology? That's what I'm more interested in. And uh, Heyong Shen, 
who gave his presentation um, to the, the, the first analysis and activism conference um, where he was talking about his methodology of the heart. I thought that was really moving. And that stands for me a good example of taking a specific experience that he had and working with um, survivors, I think it was uh, the, the, the earthquakes and applying it to analytical psychology. And, and that's the, the kind of dialogue I actually want to see. So Amr, you know, spurred by Stefano's comments and answering your question again, I think that's the real direction because to do otherwise, and I know football has been a big thing. It's an own goal. It's an own goal. <laughs> right. And I'm absolutely dead serious about that. I'm glad you mentioned football. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin. A uh, really lovely presentation. Uh, people have also seen that paper from 2019. And I know you have a lot more thoughts about this. I'm a bit curious if, if there's any way we can distribute some of these or if you're going to publish them later. Yes, I am going to, to work this hopefully into a paper. Um, so watch the space. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. We will be, uh, as Europeans do, I have learned these things, not meeting in August. So we'll meet in, um, in September. Uh, this fall, we'll be seeing George Hoganson, Ursula Brasch, our own Stefano Carpani, and Roderick Main. And of course, the video of this talk will be up in a couple of weeks on YouTube. And we look forward to seeing all of you in a couple of months. Uh, continue to be careful, whatever the local laws are, and take care of yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>